Policies related to three issues in particular are important to many people in the Latino community, immigration, transportation, and bilingualism. Immigration policy. Comprising about a million people, the Latino population in Georgia is a diverse group. Some of them were born here, some of them moved here from other parts of the U.S., and others immigrated recently or many years ago from Mexico, Puerto Rico, Guatemala, Peru, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Colombia, and elsewhere. Nationally, in 2010, about 37% of all Hispanics reported being born outside the U.S. For some groups, such as Guatemalan and Honduran origin populations, more than two-thirds were foreign-born. In Georgia, however, our Latino population is split evenly between those born in the U.S. and those born in another country. Place of birth is not the same as citizenship. According to the Pew Hispanic Center, in 2010, there were more than 540,000 Latinos in Georgia aged 18 and over. Of these, about 154,000 are U.S.-born adult citizens. Another 66,000 of Georgia's Hispanics over the age of 18 are naturalized citizens, and many more are legal permanent residents who have work visas or green cards. But even within the same family, it's not uncommon to have some members who are U.S. citizens and some who are not. Even among siblings in the same family, some may have been born in the U.S. and some in other countries. There are thousands of Latinos in Georgia who are not citizens or legal permanent residents. Because of this, immigration policy, laws, and reforms are an important topic for many people who are part of or work with Latino communities. Undocumented Immigrants As of 2010, Georgia was estimated to have about 425,000 undocumented immigrants, about half of whom are of Mexican origin. While recent state laws may have led to a decrease in that number, it's clear that our state is home to many people who do not have official permanent residence. It's also important to remember that not all of these are people who cross the border illegally. Many may instead have overstayed their student, work, or tourist visas. Immigration policy and specific laws that regulate immigration are too complicated to address here, and they change periodically. Still, while well-meaning people often have strong differences of opinions about immigration policy, most people agree that our current system is not working well enough to balance the needs of the global and local economies, nor to address the demand of people wanting to come to the U.S. For instance, there is a strong economic incentive for workers to cross the border in search of better paying jobs. In 2012, the Mexican government raised the official minimum wage to the equivalent of U.S. $4.60 a day. Compare this with the $7.25 an hour minimum wage in the U.S. So work in the U.S. offers 12 times more pay for the same sort of work than in Mexico. That would sort of be like if you could move to a neighboring country and earn $90 an hour for an unskilled entry-level job, a high potential reward for the risk of border crossing. Segments of our economy in the U.S. and in Georgia also have depended historically on a strong supply of low-wage workers. For instance, in poultry processing facilities and in farm work, the immigrant and migrant workforce have helped keep prices low. In 2011, after new anti-immigrant legislation went into effect, Georgia farmers reported $70 million in crop losses, with 40% fewer agricultural workers than they needed. Why don't people just immigrate legally? People in other countries who want to come to the U.S. can try to do so in several ways, as tourists, students, temporary workers, skilled professional workers, refugees, or permanent green card holding immigrants. As mentioned earlier, hundreds of thousands of Georgia's Latinos are legal permanent residents. However, it is actually not particularly easy for people to immigrate legally, especially if they are not highly educated or trained in specialized fields. For instance, the Immigration Act of 1990 established a lottery for green cards to allow adults with at least a high school education or two years of job training to apply for legal immigration from countries around the world to the U.S. Of the 50,000 open visas available each year, in 2011, over 12 million qualified applications were received, so potential immigrants had a 4 in 1,000 chance of being selected for the lottery. In some cases, countries with high rates of immigration, including El Salvador and Guatemala, were excluded from the lottery altogether. 
According to the Migration Policy Institute, there is a considerable backlog and waiting list for processing requests for visas for family members of people who are here legally. A U.S. citizen wishing to sponsor an unmarried adult child from Mexico, for instance, has to wait about 19 years before the application will be processed, though there is only about a three-year backlog for applications for spouses and minor children of legal permanent residents. For these reasons, many people in immigrant countries are hopeful for changes in the current U.S. immigration system that would make legal residency easier. The DREAM Act the desire for policy change is especially true for people who are brought to the U.S. by their parents as children without legal permanent resident status. Through no fault of their own, these children face real challenges. While K-12 attendance is a guaranteed right for all people in the U.S., regardless of immigration status, once undocumented students graduate from high school, they are considered illegal aliens, even if they have good grades, are fluent English speakers, and have never been in trouble. As illegal aliens, they cannot get financial aid, attend top-tier colleges like the University of Georgia, or legally seek employment. President Obama's 2012 executive order granted a temporary reprieve for young people in this category. Undocumented immigrants under 30 who came to the U.S. before age 16, don't have a criminal record, and are enrolled in school or have graduated, can apply for work permits and are temporarily protected from deportation. However, this path does not lead to permanent residency or U.S. citizenship. One set of legislation that might create such a path is referred to as the DREAM Act. Different versions have been introduced in Congress several times over the past decade with bipartisan support. The legislation would allow legal permanent residence and eventual citizenship for undocumented young people brought to the U.S. by their immigrant parents and who graduate from high school, go to college, or join the military. However, as of 2013, the DREAM Act has not yet passed. Transportation Policy Another topic affecting some in the Latino community is transportation. It's easy to assume that everyone can get where they want to go, but is that really the case? We might think that people can take public transportation, drive, or take a taxi as needed. Let's consider each of these possibilities. First, remember that Georgia's Latino population is disproportionately living in poverty. The 2010 census reports that Hispanics in Georgia earn an average of only $17,300 per year. At the same time, many of the affordable housing options for low-income populations, such as trailer parks, are not allowed by zoning codes except in outlying areas. Likewise, the least expensive houses are often pretty far from the city center. These neighborhoods likely do not have sidewalks or safe ways to walk to where they work, shop, worship, study, or go for medical care. Similarly, these outlying neighborhoods may not be served at all by public transportation like the bus system. In Athens, for instance, hundreds of Latino families live in mobile home parks such as Pinewood Estates North and Country Corners, north of Athens Technical College. The nearest bus stop is over two miles away along a four-lane highway with no signs. What about taxi service? Well, for families who live in Pinewoods, for instance, a taxi ride to downtown Athens costs more than $15 one way, which is hardly an affordable option for regular use. For many of us, simply driving places in our car seems like the simplest solution, but this is not possible for everyone. First off, car ownership is the second biggest household expense after housing. Furthermore, according to a 2012 Forbes magazine report, Georgia is the fifth most expensive state to operate a car in. For low-income people, car ownership would take a disproportionate slice of their income and may actually be simply unaffordable. Besides, not everyone has or can get a driver's license. In Georgia, if you have a driver's license from another country or state for that matter, it is not valid after 30 days of living in Georgia. Additionally, undocumented immigrants cannot receive driver's licenses in Georgia. Drivers cited for driving without a license face a first-time fine of $500 to $1,000. Additional convictions may cost up to $5,000. After four convictions, driving without a license can be considered a felony. So anyone living in Georgia and driving without a Georgia driver's license is taking a very significant risk. So when a Latino parent doesn't come to an event like a parent-teacher conference or health fair, or a child doesn't take part in after-school enrichment activities or clubs, it can be because there is no way for them to get there and back. An immigrant who wants to learn English but has no car or license to get to the church or school that is teaching it may find it impossible to take part, even if the service itself is free. 
policies that relate to driver's licenses, as well as issues of public transportation and affordable housing are often very salient for Latino communities. In working with those communities, it is valuable to understand how these concerns may impact the people you are working with. Valuing bilingualism. Because English is very dominant in the U.S., sometimes there is a sense that people who speak other languages, like Spanish, should abandon that language and try to move as quickly as possible towards using English only. Let's take a closer look at what's going on. Who speaks Spanish? Not all Latinos use the same variety of Spanish, and many may not have learned to read and write fluently in Spanish. Still, for many Latinos, Spanish is their dominant language. Remember, though, that using Spanish at home does not necessarily mean that someone does not also speak English well at school or in the workplace. For instance, according to the 2010 census, two-thirds of all Latinos in the U.S. report using only English at home or speaking it very well. However, even for Latinos born in the U.S., Spanish remains important. Half of second-generation Latinos still report speaking Spanish at home, as do a quarter of third-generation Latinos. Language choice does also differ by country of origin, age, education, and not surprisingly, amount of time in the U.S. But in parts of the U.S. where there is a lot of ongoing immigration, there are definitely places where Spanish is dominant. In fact, fewer than a quarter of first-generation Latino immigrants report being fluent in English, though nearly all second- and third-generation Latinos are. So the typical pattern is that for first-generation immigrants, their native language is dominant, especially if they immigrate as adults. Their children, the second generation, usually become fully fluent in English, even if they don't start using it until school. They are generally also able to understand, if not produce, their parents' native language because they hear it at home. But they are English-dominant as they get older. By the third generation, frequently the heritage language is lost entirely. Learning English is certainly important, and most immigrants strongly want their kids and themselves to know English. According to research by the Pew Hispanic Center, for instance, 92% of Spanish-dominant Latinos agreed that learning English was necessary for success in the U.S. But language acquisition takes not only time, it takes access to English, ideally both in informal settings and through training. For adult immigrants who don't live or work in communities that use a lot of English or who don't have easy access to English instruction, it can be pretty hard to become fluent. In Georgia, where half of the Latino population is foreign-born, fully 83% of Hispanics reported on the 2010 census using a language other than English at home. Because of this, people think we need legislation to require that only English should be used. However, there are actually some pretty good reasons to encourage the use of both languages. Let's consider first what research tells us about bilingualism. While many Americans are monolingual, knowing only one language, bilingualism, or multilingualism, is actually normal all around the world. Research has shown that bilingual people often have different brain organization than monolinguals, and that they outperform monolinguals on some tests of intelligence, creativity, and language. But because we often are not used to bilingualism, things that are normal for bilingual development sometimes appear like a deficiency. For instance, children who grow up in households that use more than one language may be slower in starting to speak. They may also appear to be late bloomers or may be inaccurately assessed as potentially autistic while in reality their development is fully normal for bilinguals. And such children generally overtake monolingual children once they do start talking. Clearly, there can be some very real cognitive benefits for people who are bilingual. Bilingualism also has social benefits. Of course, there are many jobs available for people who can use more than one language fluently, but there are other considerations too. For immigrant families in particular, keeping a connection to the family language and culture are helpful for a couple of reasons. First, when children come to school speaking a language other than English and receive at least part of their early education in their native language, they actually do better than similar children in English-only settings. For instance, Latino children who can read and write in Spanish can also transfer a lot of their literacy skills and learn English more efficiently, compared with the ones who don't already know how to read in any language. We also know that having a strong link to the family's heritage language and culture is helpful for emotional and behavioral success. Unfortunately, research has shown that first and second generation students who move quickly to English dominance don't necessarily do better. Instead, they may actually be more at risk. For instance, 
Such students generally rate lower in self-esteem, family solidarity, and educational aspirations than those who remain bilingual and bicultural. And with the third generation language loss mentioned earlier, an unfortunate result may also be kids who cannot communicate effectively with their grandparents in any language. So even though learning English is a major goal for many immigrant families, a rapid transition into English only may not be a good idea for immigrants. By the way, Georgia does have a law that English is the official language of the state. However, Georgia is not an English only state. Government agencies and others may put out materials in other languages and should use other languages when required by public health, safety, or justice. The law also says that using other languages while teaching children who are learning English is okay. We have seen that restricting the use of languages other than English might actually work against larger goals and values. Bilingualism carries benefits in terms of cognition, being able to be a part of a healthy, multi-generational community, and practical matters like getting a job and doing well in school. While we want to make sure that everyone has access to learning English, there are a lot of good reasons for us to also encourage the use and development of Spanish and Latino communities. Some tips for applying what we've learned. Don't make assumptions about people's immigration status. There is a lot of diversity in the Latino community in terms of citizenship status, sometimes within the same family. Be sensitive to this topic and avoid making overgeneralized statements. Remember also that children did not have any say-so in decisions by their parents regarding immigrating, legally or otherwise, and it is unfair to hold them accountable for their parents' actions. In terms of transportation, remember that not everyone has affordable access to getting around easily. When people don't take advantage of a program or service, it may be due to lack of transportation rather than lack of interest. Helping Latino children and adults become more proficient in English is a worthwhile task. But keep in mind the importance of maintaining and developing their Spanish speaking, reading, and writing abilities as well, and help model a positive attitude about the importance of bilingualism. Gracias y buena suerte. Thanks and good luck.